All right, uh, I kind of hoodwinked you. This is actually Zan in the Art of TDD, uh, Test Driven Development. So you can leave now if you want. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm Matt Steele. Uh, I work at Union Pacific. Yay! Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm Matt D. Steele on Twitter, Matt D. Steele on GitHub. Uh, this is my website. It has links to my Twitter and GitHub. And that's about it. So I'm going to start off with a statement. Uh, unit testing isn't going to help your code. How many people uh, agree with that statement? Okay, so some of you. <laughs> and I want to talk to you. Uh, so that is the number two most popular controversial programming opinion based on a blog post that just came out from uh, Stack Overflow. And the quote was, the only reason to have it is to make sure that stuff that you have doesn't break, and why the hell would you do this like before you write your production code? That doesn't make sense at all. Um, and if you think about it, testing is still in the minority. So the way that I got this graph was I tried to, um, I wanted to see how many people were actually doing testing here in Omaha. So I went out to GitHub and I said, find me every user that has their location set to Omaha, Nebraska. And I pulled on all the users in their repositories. Then I stripped out some of like the dot files and the things that didn't have any forks. So all of the popular repositories here in Omaha. And then I cloned them all in my laptop and I did a really simple file search to say, how many files have the word either test or spec in them? And I got this. So of all of the repositories for Omaha programmers on GitHub, less than half of them have even anything that looks like a test. And that doesn't tell you if they're automated. It doesn't tell you if people are writing your tests like test first. But you are more likely than not writing tests uh, if you're living in Omaha. So you're thinking, well, it's probably just like some crappy PHP guys that are doing that. And that's not the case either. Fewer people. 46% of all repositories have anything that looks like a test. So I broke it down by language. And I wanted to see how many people were, uh, like what languages people had. And again, you know, of the about 200 popular repositories here in town, less than half of them have tests. And yeah, like obviously, like PHP and JavaScript don't have a whole lot of tests. Ruby is actually pretty good, but almost every language that you look at, um, people aren't doing any type of tests. So again, like if you think that unit testing isn't going to help, like the proof is in the pudding. We're not we're not doing anything like that. Um, does anyone know who Kent Beck is? He's the guy that invented test-driven development and extreme programming. One of his quotes is, I get paid for code that works, not for tests. Right? So when even, the, even the father of TDD is saying, like, don't make this your focus. You'd have to be stupid to do this practice, right? <laughs> well, so I do. Like, I, I, I write as much code TDD style. So am I an idiot? Am I an idiot? I don't think so, and I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes trying to convince you why you should be writing your code test first, specifically trying to convince Corey here. Uh, so I think here's why I would do it, and there's a couple of reasons. I have a top five in descending order. First is to actually show that your code works. Uh, next is to get tools like refactoring, uh, to get good feedback from your code, uh, to help with the design of the code and just to prevent yourself from being stupid. So, number five, proving that your code works. And this one I think is probably the least interesting of it, right? You can write a test, but if you're writing the test wrong, then all you're just showing is that your behavior is always going to be wrong. So, you don't guarantee this when you're writing your tests, but I think that it, it provides some form of like behavior preservation. So, and the important part is the fact that whenever you're doing tests as a developer, you kind of have two lives that, that the test lives. The first is when you're initially writing it to show that the feature that you're showing actually works. And that's life number one. But the second is every time that you run it after that, that you're, you're guaranteeing that that same functionality still works after you perform a new build. So if you write a test that shows that like you have a bug in your code and you fixed it, then you guarantee that that bug doesn't reappear. I think that's something that most people don't think about when they're doing any type of testing. So number four is refactoring. So I'm sure that we've probably all seen code that kind of looks like this. Uh, anytime that I have code that has cyclomatic <laughs> complexity over like five, I kind of get worried. And especially when I get this, and uh, actually this is from the daily WTF, there's tons of just really shitty code out there. Uh, 
How about this one? Has anyone had to deal with like data structures that looks like this? <laughs> so this is great. Um, so it's at this point that I say, okay, it's time for me to start renaming these, uh, these DTOs to extract stuff out into methods. But unless I have some guarantee that I'm not going to be breaking more stuff that I'm fixing, I'm not going to do it. And I think that's where testing really helps you, is that you get some benefit of, like, I can rename some of this data and make sure that it's still working when I'm done. Sometimes you don't even have to know what the code is doing. You can just kind of look at its shape. So, you know, I have no idea what is inside that 26th if statement nested, but I'm scared of it, right? And I can't test any, like if, if I'm not putting, like if I don't have a good test suite, I'm not going to make any changes to this because I'm gonna be afraid of the stuff that I did or worse yet, the, like my predecessor did before me. Like that's gonna be horrible. And the worst one is if you find something like this. <laughs> Especially if that isn't written by someone, like if that isn't written by you. Uh, this one was on Stack Overflow, but I think you could get that from about any uh, Objective-C project. <laughs> yeah. So I think the refact or I think that testing can really help uh, get get you there. So the next is um, having a really fast feedback loop. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen this talk. Um, it's from. Brett Victor, he, he did this talk a couple of months ago called Inventing on Principle. And if you haven't watched it yet, you should definitely go and check it out. Um, his main argument is that creators need to have immediate responses from the tools that they're using. And what he showed is this demo where he has this code on his right side and a game that is, that is showing how the code works on the left-hand side. So every variable has a slider on it and you can change the slider to change gravity. Um, you know, he can pause the game and then he can reverse it to see how things look. But the idea is, like, you don't want to wait to have to redeploy, push something out to your iPhone, you know, any of those pieces to get a response from the code that you're writing, right? And, and right now we don't have tools, like he had to build all these tools custom. He actually got the, the designer of the, the game Braid to make a lot of the artwork for this because that stuff doesn't exist right now. So some people are getting uh, closer to that. Uh, Mr. Duke, he's the guy that wrote 3JS. Um, he just put out a code editor um, a few days ago that, there it goes. So the idea is you have your code running in the background and you can make changes to this. So like, let's say that I change the Z position from this from 500 to 300. And, you know, this changes itself. So this is really good. Um, and, and I think that our tools need to get better at this. Uh, part of the problem though, is that like this doesn't scale, right? You get one image and nothing else. Like, so having fast feedback is really important to make sure that the stuff that you're doing and that you're trying is actually going to work in your code base. So, like, this is this is a good start, but we're missing a lot of the tools to, to make this, you know, something that we can work with as professionals. So, I would say that the closest thing that we can get to is test-driven development. So, um, this is Gary Bernhardt. Uh, he's doing a, a code kata um, in Vim using Python. And every time that he's writing a feature, and the tests fail, he gets a little red bar at the bottom, and every time that the tests pass, he gets a little green bar. And the tests are running every time that he's hitting uh, colon W and writing and like saving his file. So, you know, you can just see that, that having feedback of, you know, 10, 15 seconds between the time that you write your code and actually making it pass, like that is super powerful. And that means that you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Like you can experiment and if it doesn't work, then you know, just undo a few times, right? Having a really fast feedback loop is really helpful when trying out different things. So I think this is the closest that we're gonna get until we have, you know, like insanely awesome tools. So for now, like this is the best that we're gonna do. So the number two reason why I think that you should be doing TDD is that I think that it encourages better design. And what I mean by that is, um, 
the reason that we have a whole bunch of really crappy code out there, I think, is because that it's really hard to test. I think that trying to, um, but like testing is hard when we write bad code. And solving your testing problems ends up solving a lot of the design problems. Like if, if you can't test your code, it's going to be harder to change it in the future. So, and if you think about it, a lot of the languages that we've been having really problems, like hard problems testing with, have been the ones that have been like, that have a reputation for being really crappy later on, right? We've all seen, so as an example, um, let's take JavaScript, because yeah, we're gonna go there. Um, so this is a little web app called Monologue. Um, it's really simple, the only thing that it does is you can type in something, you can say post and it'll show down at the bottom. Right, there's not a whole lot that's going on here. Here's the uh, JavaScript that is running behind the scenes. So it's just jQuery. Um, when you submit the form, it does an AJAX request, it takes the values, and, on, and when the, it comes back, it just takes the um, statuses and appends a new list item to it. So that's part one. Part two is when the page loads, it also does an AJAX request to get all the statuses that have already been put on the server and iterates through them. So there's about 20 lines of code here, but this is doing a lot of stuff, right? So the first thing is that all of this is bound to the document. So the only way that you can make this work is on document.ready. So now you have to have a real DOM in order to make this work. You can't abstract that out. In addition, you are binding to user events. So when your form submits, um, you're doing network I.O. with AJAX requests. Um, you are doing data parsing to find the value of what was in that text area. Um, and then you're doing DOM manipulation when you know, you're finding new elements. So you have a ton of responsibilities in these 20 lines of code. So how would you like change this? Or how would you test it? And the answer is you would probably use something like Selenium or like an integration test of some sort. But those suck and those are going to be really slow and you can't do like unit tests with them. So if you were going to rewrite this, how would you do it in like a test first fashion and what would the code look like afterwards? So um, if you want to put some structure around your code, you would probably you know, use some type of structure or framework like maybe Backbone to do it. So that's what I did. So in this case, um, I said, well, let's start off by making some uh, models and collections in Backbone and writing the test first. So I'm going to make a statuses collection, a status model, and expect for them to, to exist. Now right now these tests would fail because that I haven't written any production code for them yet. But uh, this is Jasmine. Uh, and then you just have like a web runner so you can pull it up. So right now the test would fail. You can make that pass by you know, making a monologue global object or global variable, putting your models, views, and collections in there, and then writing a, just the tiniest amount of code in order to make that test pass. So in this case, you know, a really simple backbone model and then a collection that has that as its, uh, as its model. And as soon as you do that, the test pass. And I'm kind of cheating here because this has all my tests in it, but you know, I can refresh this. And the tests still pass, you know, and it takes half a second and that's off of a cold reboot. So I bet that if I refresh this again, well, forget that. So then you can start making more tests, right? So the actual posting of the status can be its own view in Backbone. So you can write a couple of tests for that. You know, fake out the collection that it's using behind the scenes uh, because you're no longer bound to that if you don't want to be. So here I'm putting a fake mock. I'm spying on it, which means that it doesn't have to do any type of network I.O. And then I can write tests that say, um, when I'm submitting the form, I expect for that method to have been called. Right, so now I'm no longer dependent on some server being available that accepts these post requests. And again, you know, writing the actual production code for that is pretty straightforward. You just say, when the submit event happens, run the submit method. And, you know, it finds the appropriate values and then it submits. So again, doing that, your test pass. When you're clearing the form, that's just another test that you can write. And you can say, I expect for that text area to now have an empty value when I'm done. It would fail because you didn't write the code. All you have to do is just add this one line in that says now the value should be blank. And again, you know, you can make your test pass. 
So then you can make a status list, and again, it does the same thing, right? You're making a view, um, you're faking out what the collection is, and then you're providing asserts on top of it. So the code before that you showed was it wasn't accessible because you couldn't lock it, or what it was? Yeah, I mean, there are some tools that make that a little bit easier, like sign-in can help, but so it's going to be a struggle. So moving into backbone allows you to lock it and yeah, like having just, like you don't have to use Backbone for this, but having some type of structure around your code and separating out your concerns, like the problem with the first set of code is that it's violating what's called the single responsibility principle, which says that a function should do only one thing, right? Those 20 lines of code were doing like six things at the same time, which means that you have to take all of those into account. And if any one of those six things changes, then that test breaks. Right, so you're going to have like some tests that say, well, you know, it, so as soon as you change like the URL, every test that you have is going to break. Whereas writing it this way, you're going to have one test that breaks, so you'll know like how to fix stuff. So again, you know, you can have your test that says that when I reset my collection, that the right things show up. You can get that test to pass by adding a new model, like a, a new view, and just putting some basic code in here. And this is all pretty straightforward, but I don't want to get into the details of that. Your test can pass. And then finally, you can bind just really simple stuff to your document.ready to actually make it work. So in this case, I create a status collection, and then that automatically, and then I know that when that gets created, that it's going to retrieve all the values that I want, because I have a test that makes that pass. And then I can make my views, I can set them up appropriately, and things will just kind of work the way that they should. So now, almost all of my code is testable, and is really easy to change. So again, you know, all of your tests still pass. And you can see, you know, each of them. And for these, you know, these tests ran in less than a second, 600 milliseconds. And this is actually pretty slow. You know, if you were running this on a, on a server that had a warm cache, or if you were doing it from the command line, like this is gonna be really, really fast. So you could have this set up to run every time that you save your code. And if you're using like Grunt's watch uh, command, like you get that just out of the box. So that's really nice. So let's say that you wanted to extend this. So maybe instead of doing Ajax calls, you wanted to use HTML's local storage to save those off. Right, in order to make that work, all you do is you delete the test that specifies I'm gonna be Ajaxing to the server and add in a, new, a couple of new tests that say I expect for my collection dot local storage to be defined and for its name in the local storage to equal statuses. Like right now, that test would fail, but all that you have to do is add in Backbone's local storage functionality and make one line of code change, and then those tests will still pass, right? So how would you, so if you wanted to do that with the old code, like how would you do that? Everything is bound up to doing Ajax requests. Um, you know, you could do it, but you would have to change way more than one line of production code to make that work. And I think that's the important part of doing this in a test-driven fashion is that solving testing problems ends up solving a lot of your design problems so that you can make those changes in the future without screwing yourself over. And that's like a real benefit. Is the, the first example, example. Yeah. Yeah, so let's let's go back to that. So here's the uh, here's the previous code. It fits on two pages. It's about 20, 21 lines of code. The new code you have your models, your collections, and then a few views, and then your production code. So this is like 46 lines of code. So effectively, you've doubled the amount of code that you've written doing it in this kind of decoupled modular way. Um, but I still think that's better for all the reasons that I showed before. Because now, like everything has been separated out. You no longer have kind of callback hell where your everything is inside .ajax files, right? So. So now, yeah, you have more code, but that code is going to be easier to work with in the future. And then what's your code to test it, like it, it really depends. Like, I think in this case, it was about one-to-one. -one. Okay. Um, but, you know, you can, you can write code that has twice as many tests as production code, half as many tests. It just kind of depends on what you're working on, right? So this is JavaScript. This is like the worst that we in Omaha are doing in terms of testing. I think PHP might be a little bit worse, but... <laughs> But like you can do this in JavaScript right now. So you know, there's saying that testing is hard in the language that you're doing, um, unless it's Objective C, in which case it really does suck. Uh, but it's it's going to be tough. 
So the number one reason why I think that you should be doing TDD is that it prevents you from doing stupid shit. And there's some science behind this. And the idea is this concept called working memory. Um, and what working memory is, it's kind of like um, the amount of slots that you have to do mental arithmetic inside your brain at a, at a, at a particular point in time. Um, and it's, it, you know, it's the swap space of the stuff that you're working with. So the more working memory that you have, the more complex problem solving strategies that you can end up using. Um, if you, and, and I think that testing really helps you kind of increase that working memory space. And they've done some studies that show that that works. So what they said is that if you reduce the amount of working memory that, uh, that you have available, um, you end up re re uh, reverting back to simpler, less effective means of solving problems. So if I'm worried that the code that I'm about to refactor doesn't have tests and I'm going to break everything, I'm not going to do like any type of TDD. I'm not going to put unit tests around it. Instead, I'm going to revert to simpler solutions that are going to, be, that are going to make things worse, like copying and pasting code from Stack Overflow. Right. That's that's not a good problem solving strategy, but but doing TDD helps give you like almost like an exo brain, where a lot of those concerns that you had, you can offload them um, into your tests. So you can like the stuff that you're thinking about is how to make code better, and I think that's really important. So devil's advocate though, isn't simpler code better than more complex? And we talk about making things simple and easy to understand as opposed to. Yeah, but, but having, um, having 50 lines of if-else statements for your state, like that's not, that's not better. At least I don't think that it's better. So that's important. And finally, I have one more. Uh, and just that writing tests like, makes you happy. You know? um, when you're, I, I think that some people, you know, in order to relax, they'll go jogging, they'll, you know, they'll draw, they'll do something. I write unit tests. Uh, and maybe that makes me weird. <laughs> I'm, I'm okay with that. I think that having that feedback loop of every 15 seconds, like it just, you kind of smile every time that you see a green bar. Um, and I'm not the only person that thinks like this. Um, if you're using Eclipse as your IDE, there's a couple of tools that actually um, are, are pretty nice about that. Um, the first is Pulse, um, which is just a little plugin that Every time that you write a failing test, you get a, it gives you this graph of your test passing or failing over time. So every time that um, a test fails, you get a little red dot. Every time that a test passes, you get a little green dot. And when you refactor, you get a little blue dot. So you get like almost this EKG stat like chart that you can see like how fast your test loops are going. What uh, Anything that Eclipse does. So you know JUnit, TestNG, uh, whatever C's testing frameworks are. Uh, the other one that's kind of cool is TD Gachi, and it's just a straight Tamagotchi ripoff, uh, and it and and it's a virtual pet that lives inside of your IDE, and it feeds on tests. <laughs> so you get more points if you make tests fail. You lose points, and you can level up your uh, your critical care. <laughs> yeah, don't get to the zombie. That's bad. So yeah, that's that's the reason why I like to do testing and testing first. Thanks. Um, so that's it. Uh, both Katrina Owens and Brandon Keepers really inspired a lot of the things that I talked about. Definitely check out both of these videos. Um, they're really cool. <coughs> so thanks. Any questions? Yeah, so how often do I have to uh, redo my tests? You know, tests are code just like anything else. And if you get to the point where your tests are taking longer to run than, like if you have time to check Twitter while your tests are running, then you're breaking that context loop. So you have to treat it just like anything else. So as soon as it starts getting slow, then, you know, replace database calls with in-memory box. You know, you do what you can to make that work. But it's just a context call. Uh, I do keep my tests in the same repository. Usually I have like a, a source or a prod folder and then a test folder. And then I just use my build script to say, find me all of the tests in that directory. But yeah, I check them in, I version control them just like I would anything else. Do you, do you 
you often set up a test on a data set, like say a, a separate test table in your working database? Um, only if I have to, but if I can not hit the database when I'm writing my tests, then they're going to just be that much faster. Yeah. All right, I think that's it. Thanks, guys. Yeah.